Okay, so I was saying we'll try to finish 6.1 today. We've got a few things left, but if we can keep it to like 20 minutes per topic, we'll get through. Um, we've been looking at curves around lines and We've specifically been looking at one over X. Um, it's very easy to just come up with examples where you write the integral down and then can't actually compute it, but that's fine. Let's say Y equals the sine of X plus two on an interval from zero to pi, rotated around a horizontal line, y equals one, and this is the classic phrase set up the integral representing representing the volume of the solid of revolution. So let's take a look at this. The smos.com. Maybe before I share the screen, it's the sine of x plus two, y equals one. Sine of x plus two, y equals one. And we're going from zero to pi. Um, so the form to the is the integral of pi times the radius squared. And the radius is the distance from the curve to the line, to the axis of rotation, you see that this time, here's the x-axis. This time, everything's happening above the x-axis. Here's the curve. Here's the line. The radius is the distance between the curve and the line. And you find distances using subtraction. You subtract the bigger thing, or rather the smaller thing from the bigger thing. It's the radius squared. It's then got a pi, and it's going from wherever, from zero to pi. So yesterday, we looked at an example where the curve was above the x-axis. Here, the curve and the axis of rotation was below it. Here, they're on the same side. It doesn't really matter. You're always subtracting the upper from the lower. In fact, thinking back to the example I did yesterday, if you had an axis of rotation below the x-axis, Axis. There's the x-axis, there's the curve, here's the function. Um, 
I tend to think of this as two different distances added together. I tend to think of it as this distance plus this distance. So I say, well, this distance is two, and this distance is the sine of x plus two, and I add those together, but it's the upper minus the lower. It's just that if you think of it that way, you have to subtract a negative number. So you're adding the two. So it's not actually a different case, even if I usually think of it as being a little different. Um, it's the upper minus the lower, even in situations. where the curve and the axis are changing places. You can have an axis of rotation that's above the curve, and that doesn't change anything. This distance is going to be the radius. Our formula is still pi times the radius squared. And the radius is still the upper minus the lower. Be a little careful. Of course, when we subtract, that Subtraction distributes over addition. So we've got a negative sign and a negative two. And then integrated from, from wherever to wherever. If this is this just making stuff up, but if this was going from zero to four, those would be our limits of integration. We can do similar stuff with rotation around a horizontal axis. The trick is very similar to that last trick we did when we were looking at areas. The last thing we did when we were looking at areas was saying, well, say that we're looking at a region like this. The area formula is upper minus lower. That's not really convenient because the upper curve changes at this value. If we were willing to use y as our variable, then instead of the upper minus the lower, we could have the right minus the left very similar to what we're doing if we have, say, y equals the square root of x on the interval from 0 to 4 around x equals negative one, let's say. So we probably pretty well know what the square root of x looks like, but y equals the square root of x from zero to four, around x equals negative one. So now, 
we are taking this region, we're rotating it around that line where Nope, 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 nope. I am thinking ahead to something we're going to do later in the class. There's no region here. We're taking the curve. We're rotating it around this line. What we're going to get is a shape. That looks something like that. And we want to find the volume of this shape. Oh. It's still going to be pi the radius squared. <clears throat> And the radius is still going to be the distance between the curve and the line. So from one point of view, nothing's changed here. Pi, the radius squared. On a more practical level, um, there are differences that need to be need to be accounted for now. Um, just as happened with area, this horizontal distance isn't a y value minus a y value. It's an x value minus an x value. A y value minus a y value is vertical. An x value minus an x value is horizontal. So we need an x value minus an x value. And for one of these, well, that's exactly what we have, no plus. X equals negative one is an X value. But here we don't have an X value. Look what we have written on the whiteboard. It's not X equals something, it's Y equals something. So we need to do some algebra. We need to say, well, if y equals the square root of x, then x equals y squared. Now we can cross off that question mark and say what x is equal to. Similarly, when we've got x's, the limits of integration correspond to our variable. If our variable is x, our limits are telling you what x is between. <laughs> now here, our variable isn't going to be x, it's going to be y. Um, just like with area, upper minus lower turns into a right minus left. So you see that our area is our variable, sorry, is y. We'll put a dy here because our variable is y. And our limits of integration are what? They can't be zero and four. Zero and four are x values. X starts at zero, x ends at four. What we need 
our y values, where y starts and y ends. And if we look at this curve, well, the lowest value of y is zero, and then y goes up to two. So we want to go from a zero to two. And we're in kind of a rush, but we don't want to be in such a rush that we don't actually, you know, learn the material. This is an integral we can take. Let's go ahead and take it. Um, this previous integral, if we tried to take it, we'd have had, I mean, it's possible, but it's a headache. You've got a sign squared, and if you happen to remember the right trigonometric identities, you can rewrite that, I think, as a cosine of 2x. Otherwise, you won't be able to proceed. This is relatively straightforward. I say relative because when you're first learning how to do this, nothing is Truly straightforward. But we've done examples like this before, where we say, well, we've got composition, but U substitution doesn't work. I mean, when I see this, maybe the first thing that comes to mind is that we should let u be the inside function, but it's hopeless here because we don't have any y, so we can't make du. So fine, well, the other trick that we have used quite a few times when we've had a power, and we wanted to integrate the power, is to foil everything out. y to the fourth, 2y squared plus 1, dy. And now, let's not forget the pi, but the integral of y to the fourth is what? 16. Wait. Oh. Duh. One fifth y to the fifth power. One fifth y to the fifth power. We bump the power up. And then we divide by it. So same thing here. We're going to bump the power up. We're going to divide by it. And the integral of 1 is just y. Exactly correct. Thank you. And now we plug that 2 in, and we plug that 0 in, and we subtract. And now, zero is always a nice limit. When we plug zero in, we'll just get zero. But let me quickly scroll this onto the physical whiteboard. Now, this is always, well, that's my least favorite part, is waiting for the calculator to load somehow. It always takes so long. I've probably told this story that I, I was at a, a 
guest lecturing at a university much bigger than Shadron. And they just said, well, if you need a TI calculator, just pirate the software. Um, they, Shadron does not take that line. Okay, here we are. Is this screen shared? This screen is shared. Okay, so let's see. We don't want to forget the pi. So we're going to need a bunch of parentheses, or I guess in this case, we really don't because the zero we can do in our head. But if we had like the integral from 1.7 to 2 or something, we need parentheses around when we stick in the 2, and then we need parentheses around when we stick in the 0, and then we need parentheses around the whole thing because of this pi in front. So, um, one fifth. <laughs> I don't know that you need these parentheses, but I feel happier with them here. One fifth times two to the fifth. Plus, not plus up here, plus two thirds times two to the third plus two, close parentheses, minus. I'm not going to bother having the calculator to do all this. Zero to the fifth is zero. Zero cubed is zero. Zero is zero. So you've got all zeros when you plug that in. Close the right-hand parenthesis. And we get about 43. If uh, in general, like if you're checking answers in the back of the textbook, the textbook is probably not going to give you a decimal. The textbook is probably going to say, well, it's 206 over 15 times pi. And you know that's there are advantages and disadvantages. I mean, the advantage is that because this isn't a word problem, we don't have significant digits. And if we round this, it's going to be arbitrary what we round it to. But again, there aren't real world situations where two over 206 over 15 times pi is useful. So just from an applied math point of view, I tend to get a decimal. 43.145. The other, the thing that remains in this section, these sections are going to get less, uh, less voted as we go, I think. So we've had the situation where we've had this curve and we've had a line, vertical or horizontal, but let's look at a horizontal line. And we rotated the curve around the axis. 
axis. And I'm calling these solids of rotation. But if you literally just take the curve and rotate it around the axis, you don't get a solid. You get an empty shell. So that's why I say, well, these are also called surfaces of rotation. Because if you think of just taking the curve and rotating it, you're not really getting a solid. Now, the idea of a solid of rotation comes from the idea that instead of taking the curve and rotating it, you might take that entire region between the curve and the axis and rotate it. Instead of thinking of having a piece of wire that you're lifting up and rotating, you might think of yourself as having a metal plate that you're rotating. And in terms of volume, it it's no difference. Whether you think of the curve, whether you think of the metal plate, the you get a, an enclosed region whose volume is pi the radius squared. The next sort of thing on our list is, what if we take a region and we rotate it around a line, but the region is something like this. Instead of taking the region between the curve and the axis and rotating it around the axis, we take some kind of enclosed region like that and rotate it around the axis. There are a few ways to do this, but we are not doing section 6.2. In this section, we're going to introduce the so-called washer method. And we're not going to introduce it in a way that really justifies that name. We're going to introduce the idea as follows. Suppose you have an axis, and then you have two curves, an upper curve, and a lower curve. And you're going to take the region between that curve and rotate it around the axis. What you're going to get when you take a region and rotate it is kind of a deformed tire or a deformed donut. It will be a hollow, re well, not hollow, a solid region like a tire, except that instead of a nice circle, it's going to be all gnarly because you have these curves here instead of a circle. Here's our thought. We want to take just that part of the plane and rotate it and it only around the axis. We don't know how to do that. What we do know how to do is take that entire region 
Just ignore the lower curve, take the entire region under the upper curve, and rotate it around the axis. That will be pi um, y equals whatever. So that will be upper minus, I don't know if naming conventions are very uh, suitable, but we take the upper curve minus the axis to get the radius. And it's pi um, times the upper minus the line squared, which because it hit it it hurts their dignity to write things like that. You will not see this in the textbook. You'll see something like this. Pi times the upper radius square. Well, that gives us a region, the volume of a region, but it does not give us the volume of the region that we want. And we ask ourselves, why doesn't it give us the volume of the region we want? And then we say, well, because there's all this crud down here that, that's in this volume that we don't want. Well, then we say, okay, but, but we could find the volume of the crud down there. The volume of the crud down there is what you'd get if you took the lower curve and rotated it around the axis. And We'll call that distance the lower radius. And the volume we get, if we take that and rotate it around the axis, is the lower radius squared uh, with the pi. So now we have all the stuff that we need to find this volume. We have this which is the volume of the entire thing. It's too big. We have this, the volume of the stuff we don't want. So if we take the big integral and then subtract away the stuff we don't want. What we'll be left with is precisely the integral we're looking for. <laughs> We don't write it this way. Um, instead, we use the property of linearity, which says that if we're subtracting two integrals, we can combine them into a single integral. 
And this just is going to save some time when it comes to actually using the fundamental theorem. It means we're going to only have to plug in A once and plug B in once, as opposed to if we find the integral separately, we have to plug A in twice and then we have to plug B in twice. So that's the integral. And just because I feel like if I use the word washer, washer method, I should at least use the word washer. Um, the visualization here, so remember when we took curves and rotated them around lines. And we said, okay, we'll approximate this with rectangles. And when we take a rectangle and rotate it around the line, we're going to wind up with a cylinder and we know how to find the, um, the volume of a cylinder. Now well, it's the it's the same kind of deal here. Except that now the rectangles that we're taking are up here. And when we take that rectangle and we rotate it around this axis, we are going to get something, my art, we're going to get something that looks like a washer. And at least theoretically, we know how to take the volume of a washer, although I say that, I'm not sure what class you'd actually learn that in. I don't think it gets taught in high school geometry, but this is where another way of deriving this formula, and it's where the name comes from. So let's see if we have time. I mean, I guess we definitely have time, depending on if we want to use the whole 75 minutes. Let's at least set up an example. Take the area. between y equals x minus 2 squared plus 1 and y equals negative x minus 2 squared plus 3. And let's rotate around y equals negative 2. A slightly different example than what's in the uh, notes for anyone who's looking at this and playing along online. So this just like it happens sometimes with area, happens sometimes with volume, that I'm not giving you limits here. I'm not saying the area between these on some interval, which presumably means that these 
that these two curves are enclosing some kind of trapped region. Let's see if that's the case. Let me zoom out a bit. And let's look at x minus 2 squared plus 1 and negative x minus 2 squared plus 3. And yeah, just as we kind of expected, you see that these two curves are enclosing a region and we're rotating around negative one, I think it was. We're rotating around a line that's below both these curves. Uh, I can always tell and a problem comes from a textbook because it works out improbably nicely. But again, I mean, in theory, you can find these limits of integration by solving a quadratic equation. You would set to that equal to this. And then you would have to foil this out and foil this out. And then you'd bring everything to one side and use the quadratic formula. And somehow if you're calc to this problem, you're spending 10 minutes messing around with the algebra. As I say, if if there is an easy solution, I prefer to use it. In this case, that easy solution is to look at the graph and say, well, x starts at 1 and ends at 3. So let's see. The important take-home message, well, there were a few, but this, this one with the negative is going to be the upper curve. It's going to give us the upper radius. And the one without the negative, somewhat unintuitively, is going to give us the lower curve with the lower radius. Negative two, not negative one. So we'll set this up. I don't think we'll have time to actually use the fundamental theorem, but we'll talk our way through it. So we're going to need two radii here. We're going to need an upper radius. And we're going to need a lower radius. And um, we these radii then are still the distance from the axis to the curve. So this distance is this minus negative two which minus negative two is plus two. And 
And over here, sorry for just standing in the way, but I'll move as soon as I can. There's the upper minus negative two. Again, minus negative two is addition. So three plus two will be plus five. And we've got our outer radius and our inner radius. And the formula is pi. I should have jotted this down, but let's see, we're going from one to three. And now, sadly, the, uh, the washer method can give kind of bears of problems. There's a reason I said we're not going to have time to finish this. But here's the upper. Remember that we're squaring the upper and lower separately before the subtraction. Here's the lower. Let's see. Two squared plus three. And here's the integral, and there's nothing theoretically difficult about this integral. What you have here is a polynomial, and we've taken the integrals of many polynomials before. It's just that on a practical level, we're not going to be able to deal with this integral until we have the polynomial in standard form. So this is going to be a fourth degree polynomial. And the next steps are not very edifying. So we've got negative x squared minus 4x plus 4. Then we've still got that plus 5. That whole thing has to be squared. Minus then x squared minus 4x plus 4 plus 3. That whole thing has to be squared. So this is negative x squared plus 4x minus 4 plus 5, so plus 1. And here, plus four, plus three, plus seven. And I did not need those last parentheses. And, okay, let's just get this to the point where we can do it. Negative. Negative x squared plus 4x plus 1. 
times negative x squared plus 4x plus 1. It's basically like foiling. You just multiply all the individual components and add them. So we're going to have an x to the fourth, a minus 4x cubed, a minus x squared, a minus 4x cubed, a plus 16x squared, a plus 4x, a minus x squared, a plus 4x, a plus 1. Again, I'm just doing the foiling thing. I'm taking this first term and multiplying by all the terms on the right. Then I'm taking the second term and multiplying by all the terms on the right. And finally taking this third term and multiplying by all the terms on the right. And then let's see what happens. We've got only one x to the fourth. I'm going to start scribbling stuff out. Does everyone have this written down? So as far as x cubed, we've got minus 4, minus 8, as far as x squared, we've got 16, minus 1 is 15, minus 1 is 14, Then as far as x, we've got 4 and 4. As far as constants, we have 1. So I know I said I was going to get us to the point where we could take the integral. Well, sure. Minus x squared. So x squared minus 4x plus 7 squared minus 4x plus 7 so got an x to the fourth we've got uh, minus 4 x squared plus 7x squared. We've got a negative 4x cubed plus 16x squared minus 28x. We've got a 7x squared minus 28x plus 49. And what happens? We get an x to the four. We did I screw up? X to the fourth minus four x cubed. So that's the curse of these problems. You make one little slip up like that. And then you get a different answer from the back of the book, and it's impossible to figure out why. Let's see, 16 plus 7 is 23 plus 7. Minus 15. 6x plus 49. And then once you have the upper and the lower, okay, 
I think at this point, we can just kind of talk our way through this. We'll take this upper, this fourth degree polynomial, we'll subtract the lower, this fourth degree polynomial, we'll actually get a fair amount of cancellation. The result is going to be small. The result is going to be a second degree polynomial. And then once we found the upper minus the lower and it's just a quadratic, we can take that integral, bump the powers up, you know, plug in the limits of integration. Don't forget the pi at the end. All right, stay, looks like maybe, nope, still going. Stay dry out there if you can, you know. See you next week.